Sir. Do I have a last request? Si, certainly. A cigarette. Why not? A cigarette is no good without a light. Only one request. Good evening and welcome to the show. I've been living in England on and off for about 15 years. And people ask me, they say to me, why did you leave Ireland? I left Ireland because it was bloody lonely. <laughs> Place is full of Japs and Germans. I don't speak the language. How do you say top of the morning to a Jap? Hathanamaha! Hathanamaham hathakadawahata! Wanawa! He looks at you and say, ha so. I mean, where else in the world would you be standing by a bus stop in an island and a man will come up and say, Is it yourself? <laughs> you'll say, No, it's not yourself, it's yourself's brother. <laughs> he said, Well, the next time you see yourself, will you give yourself me regard? <laughs> he said, I will. Who was sending him? I'll just say him silly. <laughs> the Irish, we have a... We have a different approach to life than the English. It's... You see, with the English, the philosophy of life of the English is something like never do tomorrow what you can do today. The philosophy of the Irish is never do tomorrow what you can do next Friday. And if you can't do it, then don't bother about it at all. <laughs> and we speak, we, we speak English, but English is not our language. It's not a real language. Our own language is Gaelic. So consequently, when we do speak English, we speak it differently, or we approach it differently, or we even listen to it differently. If an Englishman were to say to me, go and do your own thing, I wouldn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> My mind would race off on a different angle, and I would say to myself, it's impossible. <laughs> so we do, we do take things, do take things much more literally. For example, you get what we call the old Jarvey, and he's taken an Englishman up to a hotel, which has got a long, long driveway. And after about 20 minutes going up the driveway, the Englishman said, it's a rather long driveway, this. And the Irishman said, well, if it was any shorter, it wouldn't reach the hotel. <laughs> the Irishman has gone up in court and the judge looks at him and says, you have been accused of a felonious crime, and you shall be found guilty or not guilty according to the evidence presented to this court. How do you plead? The fellow says, I don't know. Your Honour. He says, what do you mean you don't know? Do you plead guilty or not guilty? He says, I can't plead either, sir. I haven't heard the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, the, the, the Irish have had a relationship with the English. Uh, <laughs> many Irish people have joined what is known as the British Army. People like Wellington, Kitchener, French, Montgomery, Alexander, O'Gorman, Timoshenko. <laughs> and this is a story about a, an Irishman who joined his British army and he eventually f winds up as being a batman to a colonel. And after a campaign in the North African desert, a ghibli or a blizzard blows up and they get lost. And they roam around the desert for three days until they eventually come to the Nile and they're both dying of thirst. And the colonel says, Go and get me some water from the Nile. And the sergeant comes off, comes back, and he says, Sir! They can't go near the water. It's full of crocodiles. And I'm terrified out of the life out of me by them big jaws going. <laughs> Said, Mike, don't, don't be silly. Those crocodiles are more frightened of you than you are of them. He said, in that case, sir, the water is not fit to drink. <laughs> this is a story about a fellow who's working on the building site. 
And the general foreman comes to me and he says, I'm going to give you an intelligence test because I'm thinking of making you the assistant foreman. And it all depends how you, how you get on with this intelligence test. And he says, right, I'm ready, I'm ready. Right, fire away. Throw the questions at me. <laughs> I'm ready. He says, right. He said, what have you got two of? They're on your feet and you walk to work in them every morning. God, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> They're on my feet. And I walk. No idea. He said, a pair of boots! You fool! Shall we try again? What have you got two pairs of? You put them on your feet. One of them you walk to work in, you work in and you walk home. The other pair you put on your feet and you go out dancing. <laughs> <laughs> you have any easy ones? <laughs> God, that's, that's a terribly difficult question to ask any man. I have no idea. He said, two pairs of boots, you fool! <laughs> He said, last question now. He said, what stands four and a half feet high? Has got horns, udders, <laughs> gives milk, and goes, mmm. <laughs> oh, be God. Would it be three pairs of boots? <laughs> Big microphone. I'm talking. Did you like it? <coughs> You're not deaf, are you? Why do you those things on your ears? Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever have a day when you get out of bed and you put your sock on and then you put your second sock on top of your first one and you spend a half an hour looking for the first sock? <laughs> <laughs> and then you cut yourself shaving, you go downstairs, you have a cup of coffee, you spill it, and you get a letter from the tax man. <laughs> you go outside and the car doesn't stop. Start. I'll stop. <laughs> and you think to yourself, when we've all had them, it's one of those days. There we are, Sergeant. This is the 407 Gunter. Oh, I see, sir. It's a comparatively easy bomb to... Dismantle? Yes. Ah. Good work. Good work. <laughs> now, good idea. You see, unlike some of the other German bombs, this one is not booby-trapped here. Mm. It's booby-trapped in the nose. Ah. So it's quite safe, really, to, to start the diffusing from this side here. I just give it a quick turn. There we are. I remove this plate here, ah. therefore giving me access to the wires in here. <laughs> Morning, Becca. Nice to hear the bells again. I haven't heard them since the war. And in those days, it meant invasion by the German paratroopers. Stick the up. England is fine. Hey, game. Fire! Missed. Hey, game. Fire! Charge! <laughs> Red dragon to blue leader. Red dragon to... Oh, God, sir, I, I can't get through. You must, Carruthers, you must. Otherwise, we're likely to be overrun. Sir, there's only one thing for it. Not that, Carruthers, not that. Oh, please, sir, let me try. You'll get killed. What? I insist. If you insist, Carruthers, good luck. Good luck. Sir. Fools, coming back. 
Sir, they're engaged. <laughs> I can assure you, madam, that this is our very latest model. You can do a 380 degree turn on your own axis. It not only combines great comfort, but is highly elegant. I'd like you to notice if you would the stainless steel wheels. Stainless, therefore no rusting, therefore no polishing. The foam-filled body-fitting cushions are fully washable. It is guaranteed for 10 years and has detachable handles. <laughs> <laughs> detachable handles! <laughs> One. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce my very first guest on the show tonight, magician Roderick Brodini and his assistant Eileen. Eileen? something about it. Switch off. If you turn it off, I'll get at the end. I, I, I don't know how you suffer from boredom, but to me, the most boring of all places to be stuck in traffic jams. Sit in a traffic jam and I think, what can I do? Turn on the radio, listen to the records, interrupt the disc jockeys. <laughs> you get that fool saying, there's a JY saying B for N. <laughs> you know what I do? You know what I do to beat the boredom? I sit and look at the registration plates all around me, and I take the letters and the sounds phonetically. Instead of saying G, I say G. <laughs> and for N, I don't say N, I say N. And U, U. Uh. <laughs> and I make up words. I go, G, N, U. But what? one day, there's a colour fellow in the car next to me and he said, take the second on the left. <laughs> well, Pete, do you know what I do? I do things. I, I even bought a penny whistle. I used to practice in the car. Stuck and I go... Which is great. Somebody ran me up the back with a big hole in the back of my head. <laughs> I had... Years ago, and I must tell you, it's, it's a very true story. I had chapped lips. You know how you get chapped lips? And there's a special thing in a little container to put it on. And I'm in the car and I'm sitting. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. I'm doing my lips. I Can I get the mirror? <laughs> you have the feeling when you're being looked at. <laughs> I mean, 
fell out in the car next to me and he's going... <laughs> oh, and I, I had a friend of mine who used to work in a circus. He was the elephant man in the circus. And I said, now, how do you like the job? He said, like it? He said, terrible. Fourteen elephants. I scrub them, I wash them, file the toes, clean the teeth, take the hay out, bring the hay in, feed them. Eighteen hours a day. I'm so bored. I said, why don't you leave? He said, what? Get out of show business? The <laughs> <laughs> funny thing about man, no matter what we do, if we do it long enough, we'll get bored with it. But man has some sort of inbuilt instinct to revitalize an interest in what he's doing. It's a safety device. Perhaps the most boring thing anyone could ever do is house hunting. But with a little twist, even house hunting can become interesting. me out. <laughs> it is said that the most cruel and unkind of all God's creatures is man. Who but man would say of man, never hit a man when he's down, kick him, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> I would like now to show you some very unkind acts by man to his fellow man. Defendant. Parking on a double yellow line, my lord. Parking on a double yellow line. How do you plead? Uh, not guilty, Your Honour. All the evidence before me suggests that you are guilty. And after giving this case due consideration, I so find you guilty. And the sentence of the court upon you is that you be taken from this place to a lawful <laughs> prison. And from thence to a place of execution. <laughs> and that there, on a date appointed by the court, you'll be hanged by the neck until you are dead. <laughs> and may the Lord have mercy upon yourself. It's only a parking offence, my lord. It's, it's, a, it's only a parking offence. It's a two-pound fine. <laughs> you will also pay a two-pound fine. There's only one man who's ever got the better of God, and that was Moses. When God called Moses to the mount to give him the Ten Commandments, God looked at Moses and said, Moses, would you like the commandments? And Moses looked at him and he said, how much are they? <laughs> and God said, nothing. And Moses said, I'll take ten. <laughs> man is a naturally superstitious animal. We're superstitious about rather odd things. We're superstitious about taking a third leg from a cigarette. We're superstitious about knocking over salt. We're superstitious about walking under ladders. In the Royal Navy years ago, there used to be a superstition in which it was thought that it was unlucky to allow a ship to sail on a Friday. And the government of that day, to lay this superstition, decided to have a ship commissioned on a Friday. The keel was laid on a Friday. The ship was launched on a Friday. It was named HMS Friday and it made its maiden voyage on a Friday. The superstition was laid to rest, except for one thing. 
the ship and the crew were never ever heard of again. <laughs> <laughs> don't doubt me, that's a true story. It's a true story. We're superstitious about numbers. I don't know about you, but I have a lucky number. My lucky number is five. And I was at the dogs the other night. And I waited till the fifth race. I waited till five minutes before the fifth race. I picked out the fifth bookie. I went to him and I put five pounds to win on number five. And you're right, he came in fifth. <laughs> The Irish, uh, you see, we have different superstitions to the English. Uh, for example, an Englishman would never, ever walk through a graveyard at night. An Irishman would. The thing I never figure out about graveyards is why they big, build big walls around graveyards. Because the people on the inside are not going to come out. <laughs> and the people on the outside don't want to go in. <laughs> but superstition, I think, is born from a fear of the unknown. Man is not frightened by what he knows. Man is frightened by what he doesn't know. Man can be frightened by fog, by mist. But when darkness descends, fear can turn to sheer terror. Drink is master. We have a very low crime rate. I don't know why, but there is in Ireland an exceedingly low crime rate in comparison to anywhere else in the world. And there's a story about a bank inspector, and it's a true story. 
a bank inspector travelled over to the west of Ireland and he arrived in, the, in a small town and all they had was a pub and a couple of houses and a bank. And he went into the bank and there's not a soul there. No tellers, no money, nothing. All the money's laid out. He looks over the counter and there's nobody there. And he goes back and looks through the frosted glass and there's the manager and the three tellers having a game of poker. <laughs> so he thinks, right. I'll show him, goes behind the counter, goes to the alarm bell, presses it and goes, dun, 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 dun. and two minutes later, a fellow from the pub comes across with four pints and ten, <laughs> right there. <laughs> and believe it or not, but it's a true story. And I suppose the reason uh, that the Irish don't commit a great deal of crime is we believe that crime doesn't pay, in some cases more than others. Probably got the roads blocked by now. The bank guard is still unconscious. Some police have blocked all roads leading to the sea. Well, I tell you, we stay here until the heat's off. But what about food? You can get the food. They don't know you're with me. It is believed he is accompanied by a small blonde, about five foot two, green eyes. They're out of here. We wait until it's dark. You slip out. There's bound to be an all night diner around here somewhere. Owners of late night diners are asked to keep a lookout for this. <laughs> they try to buy food. I gotta think. I gotta think. I got a dark wig and glasses. I got a dark wig and glasses. You got a dark wig and glasses? Smart thinking for a dumb broad. The girl could be disguised with wig and dark glasses. <laughs> oh, won't anything go right? <laughs> Only hope that Charlie got through with the dough. I caught one of the gang with the money when his car stalled in the traffic. They got Charlie! <laughs> We're going to get out of here before they get us. Police have received information that the criminals are holed up in the Manhattan Hotel, East 58th Street. Charlie, the punk! <laughs> he talked! <laughs> we get out of here before they surround the joint. to all precincts and police are now covering the hotel exits. <laughs> Up the fire escape. Up the fire escape. <laughs> attention, attention. Police are warned not to use any fire escapes at the Manhattan Hotel, as these are unsafe and likely to collapse. This goes to prove that crime doesn't pay. Have you ever thought what would happen if we didn't have any crime? Have you ever thought of all the number of people who'd be out of work if we didn't have crime? Judges, barristers, solicitors, policemen, policemen, even criminals would be out of work. <laughs> How would they make a living? They'd have to turn to crime. <laughs> That's an Irishism. But crime, crime does exist. And one of the great things is to be ahead, or one step ahead of the criminal. And no one knew this better than the immortal Sherlock Holmes. Hurry, Watson, I fear that we are too late. All right, Holmes. Watson? <laughs> Squire! <laughs> Squire, tell me, what have you seen? <laughs> Steady up, man! It's imperative that we must know what you've seen. The life of your daughter depends on it. Watson, you're a medical man. <laughs> Calm him down. Find out what he has seen. All right, Holmes. Now then, old man, you tell me what you've seen. <laughs> Watson, what is the scene? Wait, Watson. Uh huh. Uh huh. What is it, Holmes? Watson, behind this bush is a Scottish dwarf wearing a red beard, carrying a chicken, and using as a means of transportation roller skates. God, you're incredible, Holmes. Shall we see him out? Yes. Right, Watson, you go that way, I shall go this way. Right, Holmes. My God, he's not here. Oh. I've failed. Oh, no. It's the first time I've ever failed in my life. Oh, don't worry. I'm a failure. No, don't worry. A complete don't failure. Worry. A complete failure. <laughs> Watson? Yes, Holmes. 
If I'm not mistaken, here comes your murderer now. Three is not bad. <laughs> but now, let us see how our magician is getting on. asking me what I do to relax. I play golf. I go out, I walk in the fresh air, I play 18 holes of golf, I come back home and my wife says, do you feel nice and relaxed? And I say, why don't you mind your own bloody business? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is more indifferent to another man's feelings than a golfer. For example, you get the gentleman who rushes into the club and he said, did you hear the Carruthers beat his wife to death with his number club, number five iron? He said, did he by golly? How many strokes? <laughs> the two deadly enemies playing golf and out on the ninth hole one of them had a heart attack stroke he went <coughs> and the other fellow marked it on his card <laughs> you got the two drunks on the tee and, and no I, I I didn't see six golf balls she said well you should be able to hit one of them you got enough clubs in your hand <laughs> And then I had the ball. And then he hits the ball straight up the fairway. There's a fellow walking across the fairway, gets it right in the back of the head. Boom, down he goes. <laughs> <laughs> and they run up to him, and the ball is embedded in the fellow's skull. And the fellow who played through his side. <laughs> Use your wedge. <laughs> what is indifference? I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose indifference is a total disregard by one man to another man's misfortunes. <laughs> During the show tonight, I have shown you the worst sides of man, but man is capable in many ways of offering a helping hand.
hand, but in doing so, you can often end up with trouble that you don't really need. Horse! A horse! My kingdom for a horse! I have set my life upon the cast, and I shall stand the hazard of the die. I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. A horse! A horse! <laughs> my kingdom for a horse! <laughs> Do you realize that you are about to change the course of English history? <laughs> the funny thing about the Irish, when we say something like Richard III, the Irish have difficulty in the in the pronunciation of T and H. We don't say this, that, these and those, we say this, that, these and those. So when we come to Richard III, we have difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> and the English have a similar difficulty where you, you drop your H. The English people, instead of saying horse, they will say horse. A house and things like that. You get a fellow who goes into a poultry shop and he said, uh, Oh, I love that uh, peasant hanging up there. <laughs> well, he says, Peasant? Peasant? You stupid nit. That's a fortridge. <laughs> now, can we have our final look at our disillusioned illusionist? Criticism which is leveled at the younger generation is that they're quitters. They give in too easily. But this is one criticism which could never be leveled at the older generation who carried on right through to the bitter end. Oh, 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 I, I don't feel very well. Oh, I'd ring for James. Oh. Never remember to rest. Go on, Goodbye. I'm coming. I'm coming.
you rang me lot. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming very close to the end of the show tonight. And I've talked a great deal about man. But no matter what, man is unkind or unjust or intolerant. At the end of his life, he will eventually finish up with the just reward. Arise, Sir Toulouse-Lautrec. <laughs> Night, and may your God go with you. Thank you. Political scandals, cat impressions, and a whale in London. It's been a funny old week. Al Murray and Gina Yashiri are among the comics standing by to have their say on the big stories. Mock the week next on BBC Two.